All right, guys. Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to the fifth York event that we've uh, held. And it's, uh, I think it's the third one in the Radisson, and it's a two-day event, which is which is a first. I think it's good. Um, I just want to go through a few housekeeping bits um, before we get into the, the main show. Um, please put your phones on silent, of course, just in case. Um, I haven't organised specific coffee breaks or tea breaks like normal. I've actually just allocated 10 minutes between um, each uh, presentation where you can go to the loo, go up to your room or get a cup of coffee or, or biscuits or whatever. Um, we've got a couple of sessions today which are interesting and I think they really work in an intimate setting um, where the speakers are basically going to frame the topic and the subject matter and then we're going to move on to an open debate. So I do encourage you to you know, keep the thing keep the thing going because I think there'll be interesting um, topics. Um, we've got two keynote uh, speakers, well, speaker teams in fact. Uh, today we've got Gary Shaw and Brian Edwards who are basically are telling the uh, Ricky White story of his father, uh, Roscoe White. Um, as you know, this is quite a controversial area. Um, it crashed and burned in 1990 when they held their press conference uh, in Dallas. But uh, Gary really believes in this. Uh, I've read the book. I think it's very interesting. I think there is a lot of validity in, in it. Uh, and it's one of our first surprises today. Uh, Ricky White will be actually joining us um, in the presentation. So you will have an opportunity to ask some potentially challenging questions. But I just ask you please to be respectful. Um, even if you don't think that this um, story is valid. Um, likewise, uh, tomorrow our keynote speaker team is uh, Larry Hancock and David Boylan, both of whom are friends of DP UK. Uh, and it, we obviously do finish earlier on the second day, we always do. We're finishing at four. Can I please ask you not to leave uh, before four o'clock? We've got 13 people today, we've only got eight tomorrow. So it will be pretty disrespectful if we thinned out uh, before four o'clock. Um, the room is secure, um, so you can leave your things overnight if you're staying uh, here overnight. Uh, you wouldn't be surprised to see that there's a book sale um, over there. I'm hauling the same books from York to Canterbury each year. Um, Johnny's already take, taken some and um, Paul has, has bought one as well. Um, I do encourage you to try and buy something because it is for the benefit of uh, the society. There's some classics there and there's some interesting stuff and there's some very rare things on the on the right hand side and they're all very reasonably priced. I mean you know those of you that know this market um, these are heavily discounted um, for members. I've um, got a couple of other surprises for you. Let's start off with the... we've got a virtual reality uh, headset here <laughs> and you I want everyone to have a play around with this. Um, it's basically, it's Johnny's, and it will show you what Dallas looked like in 63. So that would be quite some fun between sessions. And then the, other thing we've, the other thing we've got down here is a car Carmen, which also is Johnny's. And uh, we'll get this out, and you can play around with that, with the bolt action and everything else. Please don't do it in front of the windows, because <laughs> there is a there's a police station next door, and we don't want a SWAT team coming in um, in 90 seconds, presumably. It is Ian. It's all right, I've looking for a mouse. <laughs> so uh, enjoy those. Um, Dinner tonight, for those of you that are staying, it's next door. Um, obviously you've prepaid and chosen your courses. Um, there is a seating plan to try and mix and match you, it up a little bit. The course is written down somewhere, because yes. I've forgotten mine. Uh, I have got it written down, and so is the, so is the hotel. But uh, you've got, there's name plates in, in terms of the seating plan. In terms of the drinks, uh, just buy your drinks as you go. They'll bring a card reader into um, into the room. Uh, the hotel doesn't take cash. Um, what else about Canterbury update? This is quite important. Um, we've got 10 people firm, which is another sort of low turnout, unfortunately. Uh, we've got seven who have committed to staying to the, at the hotel. Um, I wrote to them quite recently and said, I think, you know, we, we might have to cut it or um, 
people go to their own hotels and I'll try and get a classroom at the university. And they came back with an outstanding offer of uh, rooms at £92 a night, which is really, really good for the quality of that hotel. Um, but we need to achieve 10 people staying. So there will be an email that will go out to all members of the society, but I'm just mentioning it to you guys first. If you can schlep all the way down to France, practically, um, you know, the, the, rates are, the rates are good. Um, finally, I want to thank Tony again. He always helps in these things, both on site with the, the technical stuff um, and uh, obviously helps me with preparation of the, the actual program uh, as well. Um, and just before Johnny starts, for those of you who are seminar virgins, um, yes, would you mind just... Introducing yourselves. Oh, yeah, no, just a, just a minute, just to I'm say how you, how, you, how you got. I mean, actually, with Paul, I press ganged him into joining the society <laughs> at 1026 Berk, uh, Berk, um, Beckley, didn't I? When well, yeah, yeah. yeah. I saw you in Dallas, but if you could just. Yeah, I'm Paul, Those I'm of you who knew. Uh, I live in Hull. Um, I'm pretty late to the, uh, the JFK uh, assassination, really. I, although I, I didn't know about it, obviously, but it was only really. In COVID, that I started to watch um, uh, podcasts and things on YouTube. But I've, I've read quite a few books and um, listened to a lot of podcasts and everything. I think I'm, well, I'm not like you guys. I'm not an expert, but I know I know a fair bit now. And uh, it's uh, once you get into it, it's um, it's like a never-ending black hole. You can't get out. You don't. And you don't seem to get. But the thing is, what, what I've noticed is I seem to learn something new every day. I listen to a podcast or watch something, uh, these researchers, and you seem to le I seem to learn something new every day. I don't know about anybody else, but I have to seem to be picking up new information all the time. You know, and even now, uh, talking to people, I've learned new things already since I've been here. You well, know, you're, so. you're sitting next to a VIP, of course. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, I think there's that much, um, uh, there's, there's that much information that, you're never going to stop learning it, I don't think. No. Especially someone who's come in late like me. Yeah, well, thank you, Paul. So, Tim, do you want to thanks, Paul. Yeah. Um, introduce yourself? Well, uh, my name's Tim. I can't just think, I can't remember what, what made me get interested in it now. Um, and yeah, like you say, you can never learn too much. Here, you know, I find it annoying the, um, the fact that, very annoying, the fact that there's still information that isn't released. Incredible. Really. Uh, otherwise, no. no you know, just looking forward to today. Good. I'm glad you could make it. It was very much uh, last minute dot com, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> um, Andrew, do you want to just say a few words? Um, yeah, I'm terrible at stuff like science action is used at work. <laughs> yeah, I've been interested in that for 37 now. So I've been interested in it uh, since I was 11, if you can believe that. Uh, I still remember watching the men, the men who killed Kennedy on ITV. Um, I didn't know anything about it other than, you know, when Kennedy was shot, the guy who shot him was then shot, that was it. And uh, I, I just couldn't believe it, even at that age, I was just absolutely astounded. I remember going to school, you know, you're 11 years old, nobody cares, they all think you're a total lunatic, which <laughs> kind of still happens now. I try to get people interested in it, and I'm like, well, what about this? And people just like, what are you talking about? Um, so my wife said, like, why don't you actually go and find people rather than, <laughs> rather than boring me with it. Go and find Sounds people, familiar. Find people who are interested in talking to them about it. So I was like, this is the only place where people's eyes don't glaze over. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm like, oh, you're not interested in this. Um, so that's what I did. So uh, well, thank here you. we are. Well, you brought the average age down as well, which is <laughs> always a positive thing. All right, uh, Johnny, do you want to take it away? Guys, check with me, Neil. Uh, these things are on the, on the computer. Uh, this is your one. This is your one, isn't so it? So I can run it from that. You can run it from here, yes. And it will go on to the uh, uh, podcast later. Uh, yes, because it'll be filmed by time. Oh, okay. Can you get the, the yes. alignment correct this yes. time? Yes. Because my last talk last year missed off about the top two okay. screens. Where all the important stuff is. Oh. Oh yeah, I mean, they, they the same name, you know, the same name. 
This is, this is 6.5 Marla Car Carcano. It's deactivated, you can't fire it. As you can tell, but the boat works sometimes. Yeah. There's a, have you oiled um, it? Yeah. Have you oiled it? <laughs> well oiled, you know what I mean? There's a great doctor uh, 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 like about some, some rifle experts demonstrating how wonderful the Carcano was. And the first time you tried to fire it on TV. <laughs> The bloody thing jammed. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I, I got this from uh, oh, I got this from Peter Antill. This was Ian Griggs as well, like a Carcano. Oh. So I bought I bought this from Peter. Um, but this screws a bit. Anyone got what, a dime? Is it true what they said that um, it, it, it was a rifle used by the Italian army, but it wasn't very good? Yeah, they called, called it humanitarian. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, is that actually true that it was just a completely yeah. Used so they, they called it the humanitarian rifle. Um, used to jam quite a bit, and yeah, I mean, what the Heidel car cannon cost? What twenty one dollars at the time? Maybe less. Yeah. So I think as well the the rifle that was found on the sixth floor, it was highly likely it was going to be cannibalised by other World War Two uh, car cannons. So what they did was they found car cannons on the battlefield. Oh yeah. The trigger guard, that's a good one, or the stock, that's a good one, and they just brought all the saleable parts and, you know, just made a carcano. But yeah, that's it, you can hold it and stuff like that if you want. You can. Oh, that's uh, bullets and a clip as well, although to make it more, uh, more realistic, you should just have four. Uh, but yeah, I got the clip from Chris Gallant. I bought it from Chris Gallard, but it was in Dallas just there. So there you go. Was well, the government trying to uh, stop all these rifles being brought into the into the country? No. No, no. came back at the end of World War. I so thought they were doing uh, something, and it was possible that Oswald, or uh, there was something to do with that, where they were trying to stop them all flooding in, into the country. No, they were. Um, they, no, they were allowed. They, they were allowed. They were imported. Um, I can't remember the guy's name, he used to import them, but they had no trouble getting them out of the country. Uh, crates and crates and crates. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? That wasn't the American government sort of thinking this is getting a bit out of hand now, we're trying to stop uh, it. Not before the assassination. Yeah. This right here, afterwards. these are here, um, these are the contents of Oswald's wallet. I bought these for Chris Gallup, you all know these well, Mike. So they're a reproduction, but as you can see, it's the Hydell ID, the bus transfer for the 22nd there. Uh, all sorts. There's a nice picture of Marina in there as well. Is there a, there's a selective service card one that had his picture on Yeah, the, the high uh, deals. That is weird. I mean, I had to sign up like every other American boy mm. uh, when I was 18. They didn't want a picture on it. Yeah, so he's got, there's two select service cards. There's one with his name on it that's not got a picture, but the high deal one does have a picture. Well, nobody who had a selective Selective service card, as far as I know, needed to have a picture on it. And there, I don't know of any place on it that had provision for a picture. Yeah. And the Adel one was just was, he made up by somebody else. Well, it, well, because he probably made it up because it was using a false name. There was some reason why why he wanted to be identifying as that person, even though he used used a different name. But I can't say for sure. I I think he. I think the Heidel, I mean, there is no there is no real evidence that the Heidel ID was in existence on the 22nd. I've watched all, basically, of the footage of the police interviews on Friday, and Gerald Hill's interviewed, and he's asked what the suspect's name is, and he says, well, when they arrested him, they reached into his belfold, and they took out an ID, and his name was Lee H. Oswald. O-S-W-A-L-D. So, they never mentioned Heidel on the 22nd. There was another wallet somewhere. Well, yeah, that's what they say. They say there was, well, well three, three, three in existence, yeah, yeah apparently so. Yeah. They said there was one left at the Tippett scene. Yeah, which was, people, are, people who killed people always 
off their wallet on the yeah. ground afterwards <laughs> to make sure they can't be identified. Yeah, so there's there's one I suppose like the Tippett scene, there's one that he leaves apparently at the pain house and he's arrested with one. So I I've gone all my life and I've only had one wallet. Yeah. Yeah. It does say that in Bart Camp's book that the ID only was introduced later, so it's because he's got it all in chronological order. And it yeah, it does does make initially the initially the ID wasn't wasn't mentioned, it was sort of implanted into the narrative maybe twenty four hours after. where was this palm print? It, it was it was in the it was in the underside so it was I think it's where the um, it's the underside of the barrel so it was no it was it was in a place where you had to disassemble it to get to um, I can't well, off the top of my head I can't quite remember no, but the, 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 the uh, yeah I think it was I think. Yeah, I think it was actually yeah. under there. Yeah. The, the problem that they've got with it is, I've seen loads of pictures of Lieutenant Day, the um, fingerprint in the rifle, etc. And there's fingerprint powder all over the rifle. And the where the where the palm print was lifted from, there was no evidence that the palm print had been lifted and there was no powder or anything like that. So, yeah, so the, the, the palm print is highly contentious, for sure. Yeah, Peter Pe 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 told me about that. There's a screw and a clip. I'll need to try and fix it at some point. Use a dime. Yeah, a dime coin. <laughs> no, that was the speculation. We used a rifle to guns. Yeah, no, I don't know anything about them either. But they're, uh, they're. I, I, I just got it because I thought it was a piece of history, you know. So. My uh, presentation, it's not really so much a presentation, it's just me talking, as per usual. Um, I've just been so busy, I just, I, I've just completely, I've just not had time really to, to make a, to do a presentation for you. I've just had an article recently published on Kennedys and King, it's called The Persecution of Lee Harvey Oswald. And it's more like a look at what the Dallas police <coughs> how he was treated while he was in custody and what the Dallas police were releasing to the press about him during his uh, detainment. <laughs> so, I think it was 76 minutes after the assassination where Oswald was first identified as a suspect in the assassination of the president. <clears throat> the photographers and uh, newsmen, sorry, were basically holding up pictures of Oswald to the cameras and declaring this was the man that killed the president, this is what it looked like. And um which is pretty it's pretty incredible when you think about it because from a guy that was supposed to just be sneaking into a movie theater to seventy six minutes later being heralded as the assassin of the president, it's quite uh, it's quite remarkable. <coughs> but the media the media uh, carried the narrative that um, Oswald was a 24-year-old uh, man. He was arrested in the Texas theater, and he was subdued after killing a Dallas police officer with a snub-nosed revolver. Struggling with the, with the officers, Oswald <coughs> struck the officer with a pistol, and during the struggle, he was heard to shout, it's all over now, I've got me a president and a cop, and I'll try for two more. He He's a fanatic in every sense of the word. He never said that, but that's what was getting carried in the news. That's what he said. So the people who were getting fed this information had no way of knowing, but that was the narrative that was getting fed to all, the people. All he really said, as far as I remember, was, was everybody will know who I am. No, that was, uh, that was during, that, that was came for Roger Craig. Apparently, when he was arrested, he said, this is it. But again, we don't really know. He never said anything like that. Yeah, I got the president. Yeah. That's true. I agree with you, but that's the narrative that was getting carried into the media. So it was, it was more just trying to, I don't know. It was, it was all about trying to submit this narrative that he was some sort of presidential assassin and he was trying to kill people. I suppose. Did he not say 
at the arrest. I'm not resisting arrest. Yeah, that, when he was arrested, that's what he did say. Yeah, I'm not resisting arrest. He mm -hmm. kept on shouting it over, mm -hmm. possibly because he didn't want to be shot and killed. Exactly. Mm -hmm. You know. And so I think, I think during, in, um, outside in the lobby area, I think he allegedly he was complaining about police brutality. Yes. Yes. Have you been able to validate that? Or? Well, certainly when he was getting arrested, there was a scuffle, for sure. Yeah. And he was definitely hit over the eye. So um, I think that's where he's coming from, police brutality, for sure. Um, and to be honest, the, the, the circumstances surrounding his arrest are really quite, they're up in the air because, yeah, we have the testimony of the police officers, but the Dallas police in 1963 wasn't the kind of shining example of law enforcement. Um, so, yeah, I, we, we just don't know what was happened. I've got my own theories about it, my own opinions. But um, yeah, I, I, I think that it, we don't really know what happened when he was arrested, for sure. And, it, and it's right, isn't it, that none of the other people in the Texas theatre had their names and addresses taken? Well, there, there were, they were taken, but the list was destroyed, or was it missing or something Lost. like that? Lost, yeah. yeah. So yeah. But <clears throat> to go on to my next point, the lineups conducted were absolutely abhorrent. I spoke at JFK Lancer about this, about the lineups that all were subjected to. But for me, the most outrageous um, point about the lineups transpires at the the six thirty lineup attended by Galloway, Calloway, Ginyard, and McWaters. And Ted Calloway testifies before viewing Oswald in the lineup. <coughs> he was told by <coughs> it was either Captain Fritz or Jim Lavelle. Oh, Calloway doesn't. He, he, at one point he says it was Cali, um, Fritz, at one point he says it was Lavelle. He says they, they were, the suspects were told that they, we want to be sure, we want to try and wrap Oswald up real tight on killing this officer. We think he's the same one that shot the president and we can wrap him up tight on killing this officer and then we have got him. So this is the type of information the Dallas police was telling. It's completely neutral. Yeah, yeah, completely neutral. He's well, Jerry Spence, uh, if anyone knows who Jerry Spence was, he was the lawyer that um, acted as Oswald's um, defence attorney during the London weekend television mock trial of Oswald in the 1980s. Bugliosi was the prosecution and Jerry Spence was the defence. And Jerry Spence says to Calloway when he's on the stand, do you think that's a fair and impartial way to make a lineup on someone? I mean, if you were standing in the lineup, innocent, charged with a crime, and somebody said, we want to try and wrap him up real tight, because if we can show he killed the officer, we got the man who killed the president, do you think you would have gotten a fair shake? And Calloway just kind of doesn't answer him, and just kind of stares blankly. So, <clears throat> but this is the, so they, so <clears throat> then the Dallas police start to be interviewed on the 22nd. And this was, Gerald Hill is one of the first ones that I, that I seen being interviewed and Hill talks about Oswald's rights, he talks about how Oswald on the 22nd, um, as soon as he was arrested he started demanding that he be allowed to see a lawyer and started demanding his rights. Remember the Dallas police told the ACLU etc that Oswald didn't want a lawyer on the, on the 22nd even though the man publicly pronounced that he wanted legal assistance, legal representation. <clears throat> so, Gerald Till is then asked, do you believe that he is the same man who killed the police officer? This is merely hours after Tip is dead. And Hill says, having been in it from the very beginning, <laughs> as far as the officer's death is concerned, I am convinced that he is the man that killed the officer. I am convinced that the man we have is the man who shot the officer. No investigation, really, at this stage. Yet Gerald Hill's going on national television and declaring Oswald is guilty of killing Officer Tippett. <coughs> well, we obviously know that, um, obviously hours before that interview was conducted, Hill had declared to a police dispatcher that the shell at the scene was from an automatic <coughs> rather than a pistol. So Hill knew this information, yet he still went on national television. Can you remind us what the difference between automatic and uh well, I'm not an, I'm not an expert uh, by any means on on kind of guns or anything like that. Well, but I know that the bottom of the automatic shell has printed automatic 
on the bottom of them. So they're, it's it's pretty simple. Um, and, they're, and they're discharged, aren't they? Yeah. If it's an automatic, they're discharged. Yeah, if, if it's manual. Whereas the other... Yeah, they're slightly different shapes. They're not interchangeable. You can't use a revolver cartridge in a... I think they have different flange or something yeah. on them. Yes, the ejection. So the other thing is as well, Hillows then asked about the capabilities of the, the cannibalised and defective World War II Manlika um, in accomplishing the assassination of the President. And Hill says that from the Texas School Book Depository, Oswald would have had a clear shot and with a scope it would have probably been real easy. <laughs> Um, and then, of course, the question comes back, was President Kennedy struck from behind? And Hill says, I understand that he was, th that all the shots were fired from behind. Now, of course, this, the autopsy hadn't even taken place yet. I mean, the autopsy report wasn't written until Sunday. Uh, Commander Humes uh, actually burnt the, the original autopsy notes, citing that they were covered with the President's blood. During the RRB, when Jeremy Gunn and Doug Horn were, were questioning Humes about this, they elicited from Humes that, um, how, well, they basically asked Humes, how could the President's blood be on your autopsy notes when you say that you wrote them in the comfort of your own home? Mm. And he was caught in a contradiction, and then he told Jeremy Gunn, <laughs> I might not even have done that. So, which is interesting. But as well, uh, Boswell's notes survived from that night, and they are stained with the President's blood as well. So that's, and Humes is asked about that and he says, oh, I can't speak for Boswell. Mm. So this is all online, if you look at, if you read, it's a long interview, but it's well worth watching, it's well worth reading for sure. <coughs> so, um, Bill Alexander, do we all know who Bill Alexander was? Mm -hmm. He was the district attorney, he was the assistant district attorney, the second in command, he was just behind Henry Wade. <coughs> so, Alexander um, was interviewed by Henry Hurt for his book Reasonable Doubt <clears throat> and Alexander told Hurt that once Oswald was charged as the assassin of the president, the district attorney's office ceased collecting evidence in the Tippett case. Um, the Tippett case just went by the boards, Alexander stated. When Oswald was killed two days later, official interest in developing evidence in the Tippett case ceased altogether. There was never an indictment in the case or further investigation. Now, Alec, now, try and swallow this one. Alexander then told Hart, we all knew the same man who killed the president had killed Tippett. We had made up our minds by the time we got to 10th and Pan. The two acts were so similarly drastic and unusual that it was virtually impossible that they were committed by separate killers. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So uh, they, didn't, they didn't even do a door-to-door -door search from uh, Beckley to Tenth and Patton either. Yeah, it was shoddy. Oh, it was completely shoddy. shoddy. Now, <laughs> so you've got Gerald Hill obviously on national television saying that Oswald is guilty in the Tipper case, which is obviously it's um, it's turning the American people against them at this point because when the police are telling you that this man's guilty, you're going to believe it, right? There's no such thing as due process, evidence, cross-examination, no trial. The Dallas police were telling the people that this man was guilty in the Tippett case. And as they were telling witnesses, if he's guilty in the Tippett case, then he's guilty in killing the president. <clears throat> now, another thing that I found extremely strange, don't know if you guys ever thought about this either, was the procession of the rifle through... The, the jail, the mm. Dallas City Jail corridors by mm. Lieutenant Day. He holds the rifle up like a trophy from a hunt almost, mm. showing the world. Now, <coughs> I found this to be very strange because <coughs> the rifle is evidence in a murder case, you know, and yet the Dallas police are, are showing it to, to everyone, uh, the television cameras, newspapermen, everyone who's watching the telly. And they're basically saying, this is Oswald's rifle. This is the rifle that killed the president. To the exclusion of all others, this is the one. Now, if Oswald had went to trial, his lawyers actually could have <coughs> partitioned for the, the evidence being ruled as inadmissible. <coughs> and that's because the, basically the act of the Dallas police was sidestepping the judicial process. <coughs> and it was contaminating the jury pool. Because they were telling people this is unequivocally 
Osmond's mm -hmm. rifle and it killed the President of the United States. So I've always found that to be very, very interesting as well. And to be, to be perfectly frank, quite like disgusting, that's how they treat evidence in a murder case. Well, the whole uh, thing in the police station is bizarre. It's like, why, why is there all these reporters hanging around? You know, can you imagine now if somebody's arrested for a crime? You can't just walk in there. It always was coming out of the room. They're like, oh, "Did you do it?" You know, and it's like to, to give them their due. Why are you even allowed in here? Yeah, to give them their due, the Warren Commission berated the Dallas Police in the Warren report about it, yeah. saying it should never have happened that way. Um, Curry, the excuse that Curry gives is he wanted full transparency, but as many um, other kind of lawyers and even the Warren Commission pointed out, that that transparency should never have sides that that transparency should never have <coughs> been given at the expense of Oswald's rights, the judicial process, and uh, Oswald's obviously right to a fair trial, his constitutional rights. So that was all disregarded for this transparency with the press. And they did go after them, to be perfectly fair to them. Uh, then you've got Dallas Mayor Errol Cabell, whose brother Charles Cabell was the Deputy Director of the Central Intelligence Agency. And, of course, he was dismissed by President Kennedy following the Bay of Pigs debacle. <clears throat> uh, Mayor Cabell went on television on the night of the 22nd and declared that the assassination was the act of an irrational man. <clears throat> and he went on to depict Oswald as someone with a deranged mind as well. So that's just further embedding the narrative that Oswald was his guilty presidential assassin. Now, <clears throat> the... D. Alexander again, he was called by a guy called Joe Golden, who was a, he worked for the, he used to work for the Dallas Morning News, and basically Golden was trying to elicit information from Alexander about Oswald, and Golden asks Alexander on the telephone, what's going on down there, and Alexander tells him, this communist son of a bitch killed the president, <laughs> and uh, Golden says to him, well I can't run with that. And Alexander says to him, well, I'm getting ready to write the complaint. How about if I wrote up that Oswald did then and there voluntary and with malice a 4-4 take the life of John F. Kennedy in furtherance of a communist conspiracy? Can you run with that? And Golden says, you got it. Okay. <laughs> so <clears throat> the Dallas police, and we'll get on to this a bit later, but the Dallas police were readily um, held in Oswald as a communist, which in some parts of the United States was even more of a serious charge than killing the president Absolutely. himself, you know. They, so, half of them would have gone along with killing the president, but none of them liked the communists. Mm. And that's the thing as well, obviously Oswald is admitting that he lived in the Soviet Union, mm. which, um, but yeah, he doesn't admit killing the president, of course. Um, but this is another thing that um, Bill Alexander told Larry Sneed in his book No More Silence, which I got off of Mr. Safi there. Um, and the reason that he leaked this information to Golden is because he wanted to expose Oswald for what he was, a communist. And um, this is particularly disgusting. Alexander, uh, when asked about John Kennedy's murder, states, and and as far as anybody giving a particular rat's ass about John Kennedy getting his ass wiped in Dallas, who cares? A goddamn Yankee comes off down here and gets killed for whatever reason. Big deal. President of the United States. <laughs> Jim Lavelle, who was handcuffed to Oswald when he was killed, had a kind of similar um, opinion. He said that the killing of the president, he told author Joe McBride in ninety two that the killing of the president was no different than a South Dallas racial slur killing. It was just another murder to me and I've handled hundreds of them, so it was no big deal. Dallas police in nineteen sixty-three. <laughs> and remember when we were at uh, City Hall in November, uh, there was members of the Dallas or something like that, and people were applauding them. And Neil said to me, I don't think we should applaud in the Dallas police in 1963. <laughs> <laughs> so, the ACLU, who are the American Civil Liberties Union, they turned up at the jail on Friday night. Because by this point, people were concerned that Oswald had no legal representation. And 
approximately 10.30, Gregory Leolds, who was the president of the Dallas chapter of the ACLU, phoned Captain Fritz to discuss Oswald's rights and his entitlement to legal counsel. And Fritz told him, basically, that Oswald wasn't interested. He didn't want a lawyer, okay? So this is what Olds testifies before the commission. Sam Stern, who was the questioning counsel, says, did Captain Fritz say that Oswald did not want counsel at that time, or that he was trying to obtain his own counsel? Olds, what I was told, that he had been given the opportunity and had not made any requests, okay? But this explanation didn't satisfy Olds. So he made his way to the jail <coughs> with three other attorneys. And at 11.35 p.m., he encountered a guy called Captain King, who was an assistant to Chief Curry. And Olds testifies that King assured us that Oswald had not made any request for counsel. Justice of the Peace David Johnson, who Oswald was arraigned before, assured us that Oswald's rights had been explained and that he had declined counsel. Chief Curry was quoted to us as having said that Oswald had been advised of his rights to counsel and we felt fairly well satisfied that Oswald probably had not been deprived of his rights. So we broke up. Now, what's interesting about this is, Olds is present at the midnight press conference when Oswald briefly gets to speak to the press. <coughs> and, of course, Oswald doesn't request counsel, not once, not twice, but three times during that brief minute he's allowed to speak to the press. Oswald states, I positively know nothing about the situation here. I would like to have legal representation. Well, I was questioned by a judge, however, I protested at that time that I was not allowed legal representation during that very short and sweet hearing. I really do not know what this situation is about. No one has told me anything except I'm accused of murdering a policeman. I know nothing more than that, and I do request someone to come forward to give me legal assistance. Olds is hearing this, yet, yeah. and Oswald is a member of the ACLU, yet yeah, Olds doesn't pursue the matter further. And it's also bizarre, isn't it, that they would just accept that on hearsay, you know, you would, you would imagine that they'd have to complete a form that Oswald would have to tick a box to say, I decline. You know, legal representation. Well, Oswald, it's quite funny because in his testimony, Olds does regret not speaking to Oswald. He says, um, <clears throat> he says, I have always been sorry that we did not talk with Oswald, which I think was a mistake on my part. So, <clears throat> but then the, um, then after the midnight press conference, Captain Fritz Henry Wade and Jesse Curry take to the television screens to speak to the American people. And um, this is what <clears throat> the, the questions are asked them. Question, do you have a good case? Henry Wade, I figure we have sufficient evidence to convict Oswald. Question, was there any indication that this was an organised plot or was there just one man? Wade, there's no one else but him. Oswald has been charged in the state court with murder and with malice. The charge carried the death penalty, which my office will ask in both cases. S question. Sir, can you confirm the report that his wife said he had in his possession as recently as last night? The gun as one which was found in the building. Yes, she did say it. She said that they had a gun of this kind in his possession. The reason I answer that question is because the wife in Texas cannot testify against her husband which obviously has ramifications down the line when we're talking about the backyard photographs, etc. Um, do you think you've got a good case against him? I think we have sufficient evidence, sufficient evidence to convict him of the assassination of the president. Definitely, definitely. Well, that was on the 22nd, but there is a, there is a telephone transcript of a, co a conversation between Lyndon Johnson and J. Edgar Hoover and Hoover tells Johnson that this man in Dallas we have of course charged him with the murder of the president the evidence that they have at the present time is not very very strong the case as it stands now isn't strong enough to be able to get a conviction yet Henry Wade's telling the people that the case is cinched well sorry that was Captain Fritz on Saturday the 22nd Jesse Curry is interviewed by NBC and uh, Curry has asked, Chief, how would you describe Oswald? Is he a prime suspect? Chief Curry, yes. Is he the only suspect? C 
Curry, yes. Question. Oswald was yelling and complaining about no attorney. Does he have an attorney here now? Not that I know of, Curry replies. Chief, are you convinced this is the man? Well, we don't have positive proof. We feel he is a prime suspect. <laughs> Question. What do you think personally? Personally, I think we have the right man. Chief of Police. Which flies in the face of his, of his later t um, argument that uh, we've never been able to place him in the, in the book depository on the sixth floor. Well, this is, this is why I, Curry couldn't have seen the Zapruder film on the weekend of the 22nd. Because if it, cause years later he says that it indicates a shot comes from the right front. Now, Captain Will Fritz, that that beacon of, uh, of, of, of law enforcement, you know. He, he was a captain of police that had no forensic training at all. Um, he's asked on the 22nd, Captain, can you give us a resume of what you know concern the assassination of the president and Oswald's role in it? Captain Fritz, I can tell you that this case is cinched, that this man killed the president. There's no question about it. Question. Well, what is the basis for that statement? I don't want to get into the basis. In fact, I don't want to get into the evidence. I just want to tell you <laughs> that we are convinced beyond any doubt that he did the killing. Don't mind the evidence. Yeah, don't, don't mind the evidence. evidence. He is telling the truth in that instance. <laughs> now, Henry Wade again, in a separate interview, is asked about Oswald. What sort of man is he? How would you describe Oswald? And this is Wade's response. I, I couldn't say, I can't describe him any other than the murderer of the president. Since I have been district attorney, I have tried 24 death penalty cases in which we have asked for the death penalty. And how many verdicts did you get? 23 out of 24. Are you going to try this case personally? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. This is a proper case for the death penalty. Well, from what you have seen, how do you sum Oswald up as a man? based on your experience with criminal types. Well, I think he's the man that planned this murder weeks or months ago and has laid his plans carefully and carried them out and has planned at that time what he's going to tell the police that are questioning him in prison. Nothing, of course, about trying to get away with it. <laughs> Just, you know, what, when he gets caught, he's been planning what he's going to tell the police. And can we all remember what the, the unwritten mantra of the district attorney's office is? Yeah. That it's, uh, you know, any fool can convict a guilty yeah. man. It takes a very special individual to be able to convict an innocent man. Yeah. Uh, and they're still clearing up the cases, aren't they, today? Yeah, yeah I'm going to get to that. I'm going to get, if I'm not bored you to tears already with this, uh, <laughs> this um, transcript. But um, then Jason Curry is telling, goes on national TV again and tells people that Oswald is a communist. And this is again printed. Uh, all over the newspapers on the 23rd, 24th. Um, uh, Curry's divulging to the media that Oswald, uh, there was loads of communist literature found in Oswald's possessions. Um, Curry qualifies Oswald as an expert marksman as well, when of course we know that Oswald was a rather poor shot. Um, that's his Marine Corps <coughs> record backs that up. Um, the other thing that the police were doing was they were telling the, the press that Oswald's paraffin test was positive and that it indicated that he had fired a gun. Wade says that uh, the paraffin test showed that Oswald had recently fired a gun, it was in both hands. Um, the paraffin test, uh, Curry says, um, means that Oswald only fired a gun. Um, <coughs> and then Curry then qualifies that um, it proves the man fired a weapon and when he's asked, do you believe he is the man who fired the rifle that killed the president, Curry says yes. Well, the Warren Commission state that um, Wade might have influenced prospective jurors by his mistaken statement that the paraffin test showed that Oswald had fired a gun. The test merely showed that he had nitrate traces on his hands, which did not necessarily mean that he had fired a rifle or a pistol. Now, you can get nitrate traces on your hands <coughs> by touching paper, uh, going to the toilet, not washing your hands, lighting a match, all this kind of stuff. But uh, in my article on Kenneth and King, I go into the paraffin tests and there is hardly any or next to no paraffin found on the back of Oswald's palms, um, the back of his hands, sorry. 
Um, and if you were firing a revolver, that's where the paraffin would most likely go, it would be on the backs of your hands. Of course, as well, during the, um, during the, um, the Warren Commission uh, hearings, Colton Cunningham testified that because there was no nitrate found in Oswald's face, that you wouldn't expect to find nitrate on his face because the, <laughs> he said that the, the bullets were so tightly compact inside the man car that when they got fired, no nitrates would blow back onto the shooter's face. Well, Vincent Gwynn, the, of a neutron activation analysis fame, and the, an FBI agent who got interested in the case, I can't quite remember his name off the top of my head, they conducted an experiment with Malnikar, a similar Malnikar, not, not the C2766 Hadel Carcano, but a similar Malnikar, and they fired rounds and they found that the weapon discharged nitrates in abundance upon the test subjects' faces. So Oswald did not have a nitrate on his face it is, in my opinion, a clear indication that he never fired a rifle that day. <coughs> so, um, Curry then, of course, he's on national TV, basically, he's like an excited child when he basically tells the, the press that they've linked the weapon to Oswald. This is the first mention of Hadell. Um, when he tells the, the when he tells the the newspaper men that it was a recent purchase, the the rifle, he says that it was purchased on March the twelfth, nineteen sixty three. Actually, the Carcano by Hydell was purchased on the March the twelfth, uh, the twentieth. Sorry, he says, and it was actually purchased on the twelfth. Now Curry then tells the press that there's these photographs in existence of Oswald in a backyard with a rifle and communist newspapers. But then he has the audacity to say, I cannot show you the photographs because they might be used as evidence and I don't want to uh, compromise. Yeah, compromise that evidence. But he can readily tell the people that he's got the revolver on his hip that killed Officer Tippett, he's got the rifle that kills the President. It's Honestly, as Jim Eugenio says, it is like the Keystone Cops. I mean, they are that bad, the Dallas Police in 1963. And of course, the papers were all carrying all this stuff about the evidence piles up against Oswald. The, the, the basically, the American people would have, if he had went to trial, he would have been kidding. If, uh, with all this kind of prejudicial evidence against him, they would have probably just, they would have probably found him guilty there and then, you know. When of course we know that the evidence indicates that he was innocent, in my opinion. Um, again, Fritz is, is saying that uh, the case is in real good shape, Oswald's a communist, and basically they're going to convict him. So, <clears throat> I'll just get on in part two here. Jesse Curry says that Oswald um, is going to be charged with the attempted murder of John Connolly. So this is a kind of interesting point for me because when Oswald is arrested, he apparently tries he apparently tries to kill Officer Nick McDonald during his arrest. <clears throat> Gerald Hill said that the gun was fired in the theatre, one time by the suspect, but luckily it misfired. The pin hit the head shell, but did not fire. Wade noted that Oswald struck the officer, put his gun against McDonald's head and snapped it, but the bullet did not go off. And Jesse Curry confirmed that Oswald was attempting to shoot one of the officers in the theatre and did not snap the pistol. Now, if that is the case, why is Oswald not charged with the attempted murder of Nick McDonald? I thought I heard the story that McDonald injured his hand by well, putting it between the hammer and the, um, and the cartridge. The whole thing is really dodgy because if, you, if you're a policeman, especially in Dallas in 1963, and you're approaching a guy with a gun, are you not just going to shoot him? Well, you're going to walk up to him and try and wrestle the gun off him, which is kind of what McDonald says happened. He says he had the gun out when he approached him, and you think, well, you would just shoot him, surely. Well, put it this way, right? If you're if you're Oswald, and you've got this gun in the waistband of your, your trousers here, and you see, because the police systematically searched, so it basically gave Oswald time to get up and run, well, they were theoretically. Some other guy, I think. Yeah, so they were, they were asking people for ID. So Oswald, according to McDonald, Oswald sees McDonald approach him. Why is Oswald then, if he's just killed a police officer, 
and they're not going to take me alive, copper, you know. Uh, why is he not, for once, got the pistol out, tried to shoot McDonald as he approaches him, or takes the pistol out of his belt and puts it at his side? How stupid is it for Oswald to go, I'm going to kill this police officer, but I'll wait until the gun's on me, I'll wrestle him, and then when I'm wrestling, I'll try and take the, the pistol out of my waistband. It makes no sense to me, eh? That whole... I don't... In my opinion, I can't prove it, in my opinion, I think it was a throw-down weapon. I don't think Oswald had a weapon on him. But that's just my opinion. Because I, I don't see the, the rationale of the whole story of... Um, try to take the pistol out of the waistband, etc. It makes no sense to me that, you know. And as well, of course, we know that when Oswald's frisked in the theatre, he has no bullets in his pocket. He's frisked again after being interrogated, and magically, he's got bullets in his pocket. You know? <laughs> so, he must, be, he must be a magician like Houdini, where he can hide bullets in an orifice of his body, or they're planted on him. It's as simple as that. Now, Warren Commission defenders love this whole episode with Louis Nichols. Now, Louis Nichols was president of the Dallas Bar Association, okay? And Nichols was permitted a short audience with Oswald on the 23rd. Now, <clears throat> Nichols was a civil lawyer. He, was, he didn't try criminal cases. Um, now, when Nichols spoke with Oswald, okay, in the, in the jail where the guys who went to Dallas, we were in the jail cell where Oswald was. Um, Nichols apparently asks him, do you have a lawyer? And Oswald says, well, I don't really know what is, this is all about. I have been kept incarcerated and incommunicado. Remember, Oswald wasn't allowed to use the phone until the 23rd. He wasn't permitted a phone call on the 22nd. Uh, Nichols tells him, uh, I'm here to see whether uh, or not you had a lawyer or wanted a lawyer. Oswald, do you know a lawyer in New York named John Apt? Nichols, I don't know him. Well, I either want Mr. Apt or someone who is a member of the American Civil Liberties Union. I am a member of that organization and would like to have somebody who is a member of that organization represent me. And if I can find a lawyer here who believes in anything I believe in and believes as I believe and believes in my innocence as much as he can, I might let him represent me. Nichols, I'm sorry, I don't know anybody who's a member of that organization. What I am interested in, in knowing right now is, do you want me or the Dallas Bar Association to try and get you a lawyer? Oswald, no, not now. You might come back next week, and if I don't get some of these other people to represent me, I might ask you to get someone to represent me. Now, that's a bit different. Yeah, so people, the Warren Commission defenders love to say Oswald refused legal representation. He didn't want a lawyer. But ask yourself this question, okay? <clears throat> if you were Oswald and you were heralded as a presidential communist assassin, wouldn't you not want your first choice attorneys? Was being framed by that point. Yeah, wouldn't you not want the best defence available to you or would you have just taken any Tom, Dick and Harry off so the street? You, no, you, yeah. yeah. You'd know by that he was being framed. And the other important caveat to this whole narrative is this. In less than 24 hours, the man would be dead. And he had no way of knowing that. No. <clears throat> so, um, it, just, it, go, it, it really goes on and on. The, 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 the condemnation from the Dallas police, their absolute insistence of Oswald's guilt, loan guilt as well. It just goes on and on. Captain Fritz, there's no doubt that Oswald was a killer. The case is cleared um, on the 24th as well. Henry Wade says that the case is closed as far as Oswald is concerned. I mean, it's just abhorrent, really, that the, um, the, the conduct of the Dallas police in basically trying this man before trial. His civil rights, civil and constitutional rights were grossly infringed. And I'm going to actually go on to this point right now because I, I know I'm, I'm uh, seriously running out of time here. But um, the widespread condemnation in the aftermath of Oswald's death was, it was, it was, there was an avalanche of it, of all this kind of information. Uh, president of the Bar Association of Philadelphia stated that Oswald had been lynched by the Dallas police and prosecutorial officials. Although some concern was expressed that Oswald be provided counsel, 
um, no matter of the legal profession, no member of the legal profession protested the publication of the evidence, the 24 hour interrogation and the violation of the prisoner's rights. Uh, President of the Bar Association of San Francisco stated that they, he believed that television, radio and the press must bear a portion of the responsibility which falls primarily on the Dallas law enforcement officials. Both press, media and law enforcement <coughs> officials must seek to protect the rights of accused persons against the damage to them and consequently to our system of justice, which can come from revealing information concerning the accused at times when the revelation might inflame public opinion. Percy Foreman, who was a Texas attorney, who is, uh, we know was involved in, with Jack Ruby, his trial, said that federal decisions for at least five years have held that a defendant has a right to legal counsel at every level, including arraignment before a justice of the peace. It's not being done in Texas, but it's the law, and Oswald is entitled to counsel whether he requests it or not. Another legal doctrine requires that an appellant show that an alleged abridgment of his rights caused him substantial harm. Foreman stated this could be shown if Oswald is persuaded to sign a confession before he has the benefit of legal counsel. Foreman said a lawyer should be advising Oswald to insist on an examining trial as a preliminary hearing is called in Texas. An examining trial requires the state to produce its witnesses and lay out its line of evidence against the accused. And Foreman then ends on this. He said that Oswald might be able to show that his trial was prejudiced by inflamed public opinion if he is brought to trial before a lapse of, say, two years. Television and press are far more persuasive than the Bill of Rights or the Code of Criminal Practice. Try Oswald a month from now and you might as well just march him out of the courthouse lawn and lynch him. And of course, uh, Henry Wade wanted to get him before a grand jury in January. <clears throat> And where is the presumption of innocence in all of this? It's, it's There's none. <laughs> well, that, that's, that's, a, that's a very good point. Has anyone ever seen, you've read stuff, you've seen the television footage, has any of them, you ever seen the Dallas police state that Oswald had a presumption of innocence or he was innocent? Not in Dallas. No. They said he was guilty. <clears throat> now, the American Civil Liberties Union charged that the police committed gross violations and civil liberties in their handling of Oswald. The ACLU say that it would have simply have been impossible for Oswald, had he lived, to have obtained a fair trial because he had already been tried and convicted by the public statements of Dallas law enforcement officials. Um, the ACLU indicated television, radio and the press, indicted the <coughs> television, radio and the press, sorry, for the pressure they exerted on the Dallas officials. They described the transfer of Oswald from the city jail as a theatrical production for the benefit of the television cameras. The ACLU <coughs> ruled the Dallas police responsible for the shooting of Oswald, saying that minimum security considerations were flouted by their capitulation to publicity. If Oswald had lived, he would have been deprived of all opportunity to receive a fair trial by the conduct of the police and prosecution officials in Dallas. From the moment of his arrest until his murder, Oswald was tried and convicted many times over in the newspapers, on the radio and over television by the public statements of the Dallas law enforcement officials. Time and again, high-ranking police and prosecutorial officials stated their complete satisfaction that Oswald was the assassin. And as the investigation uncovered one piece of evidence after another, the results were broadcast to the public. All this evidence was described by the Dallas officials as authentic and incontestable proof that Oswald was the president's assassin. The cumulative effect of these pronouncements was to impress indelibly on the public's mind that Oswald was indeed the assassin of the president. With such publicity, it would have been impossible for Oswald to get a fair trial in Dallas or anywhere else in the country. The trial would have been nothing but a hollow formality. <clears throat> now, that, there was an editorial written in the New York Times called The Spiral of Hate, and uh, it, it was buried on like page 28 of the New York Times, and this was in, I think, December 1963. And um, they state that the shame all America must bear for the spirit of madness and hate that struck down President Kennedy is multiplied by the monstrous murder of his accused assassin while being transferred from one Dallas jail to another. 
the primary guilt for this ugly new stain on the integrity of our system of order and respect for individuals' rights is that of the Dallas Police Force and the rest of the law enforcement machinery. <clears throat> and they say that the Dallas authorities are abetted and encouraged by the newspaper, TV and radio press trampled on every principle of justice in their handling of Lee Harvey Oswald. It is their sworn duty to protect every prisoner as well as the community and to afford each accused person full opportunity for his defence before <coughs> a properly constituted court. <coughs> Yet, <coughs> they go on to say that um, it was an outrageous breach of police responsibility no matter what the demand of reporters and cameramen may have been to move Oswald in public under circumstances which he could so easily have been the victim of attack. The police had even warned hospital officials to stand by against the possibility of an attempt on Oswald's life. Now there can never be a trial that will determine Oswald's guilt or innocence by the standards of an impartial, uh, by the standards of impartial justice that are one of the proudest adornments of our democracy. And the capper really for me is J. Edgar Hoover. <laughs> I mean, J. Um, J. Edgar Hoover um, wrote this. He said, he dispatched to Dallas one of his top assistants in the hope that he might stop the chief of police and his staff from doing so much damned talking on television. Curry, I understand, cannot control Captain Fritz of the Homicide Squad, who is giving much information to the press. We want them to shut up. All the talking down there might have required a change of venue on the basis that Oswald could not have gotten a fair trial in Dallas. There are bound to be some elements of our society who will holler their heads off that his civil rights were violated, which they were. And that's come from J. Edgar Hoover, you know, talking about violation of civil rights. You know, the Warren Commission. The Warren Commission agreed that Lee Harvey Oswald's opportunity for a trial by 12 jurors free of preconception as to his guilt or innocence, would have been seriously jeopardised by the premature disclosure and weighing of the evidence against him. The news policy pursued by the Dallas police endangered Oswald's constitutional right to a trial by an impartial jury. Neither the press nor the public had a right to be contemporaneously informed by the police or prosecution, to uh, prosecution authorities of the details of the evidence being accumulated against Oswald. It would have been a most difficult task to select a, an unprejudiced jury, even in Dallas or elsewhere. The disclosure of evidence encouraged the public from which a jury would ultimately be impaneled to prejudge the very questions that would have been right, risen at trial. Is that quote taken from the report? Yeah. Yeah, it's Warren, it's Warren Commission report, uh, page 283-240. Now, Nicholas Katzenbach, who we all know, uh, rushed to judgment on Oswald, said that the Dallas police have put out statements on the communist conspiracy theory and it was they who were in charge when Oswald was shot and thus silenced. The matter has been handled this style with neither dignity nor conviction. Facts have been mixed with rumour and speculation. We can scarcely let the world see us totally in the image of the Dallas police when our president is murdered. Now, <clears throat> upon Oswald's death, on the 24th, um, Jack Ruby received many, many congratulatory telegrams. <clears throat> and you can see them if you go into my, um, if you go into my, if you're not bored already and you want to read more of my article, I send a link to all, I think it was about 125 or 130 of them sent to him on the, on the day he murdered Oswald. And some of them, for example, read thus they, so glad you had the courage and a careful determination to carry out the execution of the assassin of President Kennedy. Justice has truly vindicated by one of the people. I hope this message gives you consolation and that you'll get the same support from all over the world. And another telegram said, communist justice for a communist. Thank you. I feel better. Make no question about it. That is a result of the bombardment uh, against Oswald, which was initiated by the Dallas police. All the, all the statements of he's guilty, he's guilty, he's guilty, and then the man's murdered, and this is what comes of it. Congratulatory, uh, uh, congratulatory, I can't even say that word. <laughs> yeah, messages to a murderer. Is that justice? 
there's a lot of work now, was at the time. Yeah, yeah. Now, uh, I'm going to finish on this. You've got five minutes to uh, Yeah, I know, I know. Um, Craig Watkins, who's now deceased, he died in uh, December there. He was the first African American uh, to be elected as Dallas District Attorney, and he was elected in 2006. Now, he conducted an interview in 2008 when he was asked about the practices of Henry Wade <clears throat> in his DA's office. And Watkins said that Wade's office was rife with negligence, prosecutorial misconduct, and faulty witness identification. It has just been a mindset of conviction at all costs around here. Now, the interviewer asks him, you talk about the mindset of winning convictions at all costs. The legendary Dallas prosecutor Henry Wade who held the job you now hold for many, many years, embodied that philosophy. He's known to have actually boasted about convicting innocent people. That, convicting a, uh, that convincing a jury to put an innocent man in jail proved his prowess as a prosecutor. <laughs> Talk about justice. And Watkins says, oh yeah, it was a badge of honour at that time. To knowingly convict somebody that wasn't guilty it's widely known among defence attorneys and prosecutors from that era. Now, Wade had a reputation of win at all costs. <clears throat> okay? A Dallas attorney by the name of Kenneth Holbart said that Wade was a brilliant attorney. He got the maximum that was available. The maximum is what he always got. Another uh, Dallas assistant district attorney said even in cases where evidence was weak, Wade would go all, go all out. He would go for broke. You'd be super competitive. And the Innocence Project stated that when someone was arrested it, by the Dallas police, it was assumed they were guilty. I think prosecutors and investigators basically ignored all evidence to the contrary and decided they were going to convict these people that they had fingered for these crimes. Now, I'm going to go through some of the crimes and some of the innocent people that was convicted under Wade's tenure. <coughs> Randall Adams, who I don't know if you've all seen the film Blue Line, um, he was wrongfully convicted in 1976. The reason he was convicted was because he was convenient. The, the Dallas police knew who the murderer of the police officer, a guy known as Robert Wood, was, but because he was 16 or 15, they couldn't get the death penalty, so they fingered it on Randall Adams so they could get a conviction and put him to death. Now, when Adams was arrested, he was put into an interrogation room and he describes his experiences at the hand of the Dallas police. Now, um, the <clears throat> police officer who was interrogating was a guy called Gus Rose, who we all know from JFK. Gus Rose walked into the interrogation room. He had a confession he wanted me to sign. He said I would sign it. He didn't give a damn what I said. I would sign this piece of paper he got. When I told him I wouldn't, and I couldn't, I don't know what the hell you people expect of me, but there's no way I could sign that. He left and came back 10 minutes later and threw a pistol on the table, and he asked me to look at it, which I did. He asked me to pick it up. I told him no, I wouldn't do that. He threatened me again. I told him no. He pulled his service revolver on me. We looked at each other to me what seemed like hours. I do not like looking down the barrel of a pistol. I kept telling the same thing, that I, uh, but they did not want to believe me. Never once was I allowed a phone call. Never once was an attorney there. I don't know how long I had been there, but I had smoked two packs of cigarettes. I had been there for a long time. Linnell Jeter in 1982 <coughs> was convicted of armed robbery and sentenced to life imprisonment. His conviction was overturned in 1983 after investigative journalism by CBS News and others demonstrated his innocence. James Woodard was convicted in 1981 of murder and spent 27 years in prison. He was exonerated in 2008 through DNA testing. Thomas McGowan in 1985 was wrongfully convicted of rape and burglary based on misidentifications. He was exonerated in 2008 after DNA evidence proved he was innocent. David Sean Pope was sentenced in 1986 to life imprisonment for a rape he did not commit. He was exonerated in 2001. Joyce Ann Brown, in 1980, was wrongfully convicted of a first store robbery and the murder of the store employees. 
She was exonerated in 1990 after proof emerged that Wade had withheld critical evidence from the defence. <clears throat> John Johnny Errol Lindsay was wrongfully convicted for a rape he did not commit, a verdict which was significantly influenced by flawed uh, eyewitness identification procedures. Does it ring a bell? You know, Dallas police lineups. Um, in the lineup, Lindsay and one other individual were the only two shirtless men depicted, <laughs> a factor that had unduly influenced the victim's identification. The line-up process, which lacked procedural safeguards, was a pivotal factor leading to Lindsay serving over 26 years in a Texas prison. His innocence was finally proven through DNA testing facilitated by the Innocence Project. This is all on the Innocence Project website. <clears throat> now, one of the most, um, I know I've only got a couple of minutes left, one of the most um, heartbreaking stories for me is a guy called Tommy Lee Walker. And this was in 1955. Tommy Lee Walker was undi undeniably innocent. Yet his life was tragically taken due to the deeply flawed and corrupt practices under Henry Wade's tenure as Dallas DA. Now, uh, <clears throat> a guy called L.A. Bedford, <coughs> who was the first African American uh, uh, judge <coughs> in Dallas County and a respected attorney, told an interviewer that the, that the Tommy Lee Walker case was the greatest injustice he had ever seen in his life. Um, Tommy Lee, during his, during his interrogation, um, he, was, he, he told about the tactics that was employed against him, and it was Captain Fritz who was interrogating him. And Fritz had told this young guy, I think he was only 23, 24, he just became a dad, that, um, he, that Fritz had received a phone call implicating him in the murder of a, a white woman called Venice Parker. Fritz had received no such call. Fritz said that there were witnesses and the police know what he had done. Fritz had a reputation for being unusually effective at wrangling admissions of guilt out of suspects and his techniques worked in this case. Years later, obviously, we know much more about false confessions which occur and what can trigger them. Fear, cultural differences, sleep deprivation and feelings of hopelessness, all of which played a role in the Tommy Lee Walker case. Tommy Lee said later that he was intimidated when Fritz shouted at him again and again that he was lying about the murder. He said Fritz asked repeatedly if he had to bring in the men from upstairs when Tommy Lee balked at signing a confession. He believed that he was referencing to the two officers he had earlier seen beating a black man. So it was fear and intimidation. Since 2001, there has been a total of 44 exonerations in Dallas according to the district's attorney's office, while hundreds of cases are still waiting to be reviewed. That's it. Any, any other questions? That's a very good point you said about, about um, when Oswald was actually arrested. Why did the police approach a man who had allegedly just shot a cop and the president was, and was going to be armed into a wrestling match. You, you wouldn't approach an armed man that way. It doesn't, it, and it's a bit like um, you know, uh, the one in um, Burstall, um, Joe Cox, where they again allegedly re wrestled a man to the ground who just, who, was armed, who could have been armed or anything. It doesn't make sense. You don't, unless they knew he was full well he wasn't armed. Well, this guy's just shot a policeman, yeah. so we'll just walk up to him and try You're to arrest him. You're not going to go approach yeah. an armed man like that. They didn't seem to know who he was, though. If you no. look at the... Well, they knew it's he, all over the place. They knew he was up for allegedly shooting Tippett at that point, because that's, yeah. that's what... Well, they, they, they didn't know about the Tippett They didn't always know who it was in the theatre. Or, or, or whether he was actually shooting they thought he might be. Well, according to one of the testimonies, I can't remember if it was Brewer or somebody else, or it was it was at McDonald. When he was questioning the man at the front of the theatre, the man turned around and says, the man you're looking for is in the back and pointed to Oswald. So that's I something mean, that testified to. I read, um, when he's frisking that, he's got his back to Oswald. So, you know, you're going into this theatre, there's an armed cop killer in there, and you're going to turn your back on him whilst you do something else. Mm -hmm. I mean... It... Unless they knew before, well, he wasn't armed. I mean, the Dallas police must be the most incompetent police force in the world because Officer Tippett, of course, accosts a presidential assassin without gun drawn. And, and obviously in the Texas theatre, 
we are told that McDonald doesn't accost them with gun drawn either and just ask them to identify himself. I mean, let's be honest here. If Tippett had was going to stop a, a suspected presidential assassin, okay, he would have pulled over at the side of the road, he would have got out of his car, well, gun yeah. drawn, freeze, get on the ground. Well, he would have radioed in. Yes, exactly. Call, Call for backup. He wouldn't, have, he wouldn't have opened a vent window. No. To have a cosy, cosy little yeah. chat. Any chance you want to just come in the back of my car and I'll handcuff you? Yeah. You know, and then obviously at the Texas Theatre, they know that there's this suspect who's just sneaked into a theatre, by the way. They don't know anything more than that, apparently. This guy's acting suspicious. He's, he's snuck into a, a theatre. So they send the FBI and the whole Dallas police force to arrest him. But yeah, they give him the opportunity to, to basically either run away or whatever that, because they systematically search. And McDonald says... Um, he had his gun at the ready, so if Oswald stood up and tried to either hit him or pull a gun on him, he would have been shot and killed. Yeah. Uh, yeah, can I just say, um, about, about the trial, you know the trial he's talking about, that they did in the, uh, the 70s, was it? 80s, the, the LWT. The guy that, um, I, I was watching that and there's uh, two or three guys in suits, and then Oswald with a, with a black eye and everything, and he was saying to him, didn't you think that this one person stood out from the other, and he said, no, not, not really. And he said, he said you've got cut, he's got cuts on his face, and he's got a black eye. And yeah. the other two guys have got, you know, two or three have got suits and that, you know. I and think the guy was like, if they could have got away with putting suspect over Oswald's head, they would have probably done it. Nice me on side. Yeah, this is the man. I mean, they're doing that with Markham. Well, they, well, they coach Markham. Yeah, Markham, <laughs> when Markham was taken before a lineup, she was given tranquilizers. So, yeah, she, because she was that hysterical. She should never have been get, uh, taken to a line up under the. If you conditions. read it, it's quite funny, isn't it? Well, she says that she picked number, number two is the man I picked, and all this kind of jazz. Um, she certainly, uh, she, when she's asked, did you recognise anyone in the lineup? And she says, no, yeah. I didn't know she nobody. Number two. Yeah, I, number two is the one I picked. I didn't know, but I just had cold chills come all over me. And Mark Lane really hammered these this points home. Well, the witness was yeah. led, what the divide. Yeah, because she said three times, no, I didn't recognise. What about number three? Yeah, that was him. That was the guy. Uh, <laughs> but it is, it, it, if you look at the, the treatment afforded Oswald while he was alive, it, it's, it's quite frankly disgusting how he was treated. Civil and constitutional rights completely violated. Well, particularly when he was killed. Particularly when he was killed. And I mean, Oswald's mur I mean, think about this, right? Not one person lost their job over that man's death in the Dallas mm. Police Department. Mm. Chief mm. Curry, Fritz... Well, nor did the Secret Service. No. Yeah, exactly. There's but no, they, they said something about the Secret Service, and they said, um, why, why don't you fire them all? And the boss said, I, I think they've gone through enough already, you know. <laughs> yeah. John, was it John McClellan? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think they've gone through enough. Uh, James Rowley. Yeah. James Rowley. I, think, I, I think the Dallas Police bear sole responsibility for Oswald's death. And if I was Marina Oswald, I'd have sued them. And probably, probably still can. I mean, if you watch, <laughs> the funny thing is about Oswald's death is that the fact that before he gets laid out, Lavelle turns around to Fritz and says, go out and check that the car is in position and they're ready for us. Fritz goes out and he comes back and says, yeah, we're ready. And Lavelle testifies that when he leads Oswald out, he was absolutely astounded that the car was not in position. Now, if you watch the footage, Fritz, breaks away, yeah. and then yeah, this gap really is really left for really Ruby to step in and shoot him. Yeah. And, he, and he doesn't even recognise the shot. So no, he's the last one to look. Or Ruby approaching. I mean, you obviously see that. Yeah, of course you do. Um, Peripheral. 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 Yeah. Guys, we're going to have to wrap yeah. it up because we're right on 10.35.